Welcome to Career Insights. The Career Insights series features local industry professionals engaged in conversation with students and recent graduates about career planning and job opportunities in Polk County, Florida. My name is Laura Webster. I am an academy coach at the Polk County Public Schools Workforce Education District office. And I am joined by my colleague, Tamara Fields. Tamara, do you want to introduce yourself? My name is Tamara Fields. I'm also a district academy coach and Laura and I will be on all throughout the call. We'll be kind of tag teaming and doing introductions between each speaker. So thank you all for coming today and I'm excited to see what we have to offer here. I'm uh, Frank Dunn, the interim program director at the emergency medical services program. I'm just going to go through the uh, steps of what it takes to become uh, a paramedic. With our program, the first step you have is emergency medical responder or EMR. That is a semester course and I'll, I'll repeat some of this information again. But once you become an emergency medical responder, you are able to get a job and get employed in the emergency medical services field. Typically, you'll be working on uh, ambulances with uh, private companies that do transports. Uh, some of them uh, do run 911 calls depending upon which county you end up working for. But you can get employed as an EMR. And what's important about that is some of the places that hire you as an EMR will uh, help you uh, financially and especially with the time schedule and stuff to go on to the next level, emergency medical technician or EMT. Once this, uh, for those of you that are interested in uh, becoming a firefighter, you know you have to have at least a minimum of an EMT also with your firefighter certificate. Now the next level is the paramedic. So once you complete EMR EMT, uh, you must be a certified state of Florida EMT to get into the paramedic program. With the paramedic program, there's also some other prerequisites, which we'll get in later on, but you have to have anatomy and physiology. Now, with all of these classes, once you're done with all three of these classes and you take a couple of the gen ed classes, which I'll show you guys career pathway here at the end of the PowerPoint, you will end up having a degree in emergency medical services. Now, this is important because for those of you that are going to go into fire service with your paramedic, pretty much now most departments uh, mandate that you have a minimum of a two-year degree or AS degree uh, to get promoted. So if you go through the the the, uh, the EMS pathway, you have to do EMR to do EMT, and you have to do EMT to do paramedic. So what's left after that is like three or four different courses, and then you end up having your degree. So you're basically forced to do three quarters of it just by getting their certificates that you would have to have to become a paramedic or EMT. So with EMR, the course is a 1059C. There are, there are no prerequisites except you'd have to be a, a, a Polk State College student. You do need to take a CPR course with it. We do have a co-requisite course. You have to sign up for EMS 2930. But if you already have a CPR card, you'll just need to contact me and we and uh, we can override it for you. But you have to have the uh, BLS healthcare provider level for American Heart Association. The class itself meets once a week, so it's not a heavy uh, workload as far as for the, the, the class part. There is a skills, there are skills that you have to do with it that you will meet uh, in the lab, but that's going at your own pace. It is open two days a week for the students. If you're only able to come you know, like uh, Tuesday mornings, 10 to 12, then you can come every Tuesday morning, 10 to 12 to get all your skills done. I believe uh, some of you that are on this uh, Zoom meeting are actually in dual enrolled EMR students at this time. Uh, but once you're done with the EMR, you can get a job and working as an EMR while you continue on with your training with EMS. Next up is the EMT course. This course has two components to it. It has the EMS 1158, which is the lecture part. They meet uh, two days a week. We also have day and night classes for that. And then it also has the lab component. With the lab component, that it's not just lab inside a classroom. It also contains all your clinical stuff that you're going to do out in the field. So to get into the EMT lab, you're going to have to do a 10-panel uh, drug screen. You're going to have to have all your immunizations and all that stuff before the, the uh, fire departments and hospitals will let you come do the clinicals there. Once again, the lab is open twice a week, but it's kind of go at your own pace. And then when you do your clinical ride time, you have to do a total of 100 hours of clinical time. You're going to do it at uh, with Polk County Fire Rescue, uh, Winter Haven Fire Department, Lakeland Fire Department, and you're going to go to Lakeland Regional ER, which is a, a level two trauma center. You're going to be exposed to a lot of uh, interesting things. You will actually be running calls. Uh, and you'll be working with the team as a as a EMT. They'll expect you to you know help them out, and you'll be performing the skills on uh, real patients. 
you'll be uh, helping out in the ER. You have a lot of it, of hands-on experience to real-life patients, real-life situations where you get the user skills. That brings us to paramedic. This is a uh, limited access, so there is an application for paramedic. Typically, it's April 1st, April 30th, and this is based on the fact that the class starting uh, in August. We could have more classes in the future, depending upon the need uh, that we have, the number of students. To, before you apply, you need to have, you need to be a state of Florida certified EMT. That is a requirement. You have to have that before you can sit in the class, which means you'd have to have EMS 1158 and 1158L, which is this year EMT courses. So obviously, if you're an EMT certified, you'd have those already. Then you have to have your basic AMP or AMP one and two. So you can have this the basic course or you can have AMP one and two. If you were thinking about uh, ever doing nursing or one of the other allied health programs, you're probably better off doing the AMP one and two instead of the basic AMP. Because if you were to ever switch to another allied health program, you would have to, so let's say you took basic AMP. And then you're like, you know what? I, I wanna go to nursing. Well, you'll have to take AMP one and two. So that's like another, another year that you have to take a science, whereas you just take AMP one and two for paramedic, then you're good for pretty much any, any other allied health program that's out there. And then of course, to be a certified EMT, you'd also have to have uh, your current uh, CPR card. So with paramedic, it's, a, it's three semesters. So it's one year. Uh, they meet every third day. That's based on, for those of you that are not familiar with the, the fire department schedule, they work 24 hours straight and then they have 48 hours off. A lot of time off, it is kind of tiresome on, on the day that you're working 24 hours, but you work the one day and then you have the two days off. So the class is based on that type of schedule. And that's because some of the people that are going to class uh, are working for fire departments already that are going to paramedic school. So we have to accommodate them. So one week you would meet on Monday and Thursday, the following week, you would meet on Wednesday, and then the week after that, it'd be Tuesday and Friday. And that's just kind of how the schedule goes. Classes is, is most of the day. It's 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Each semester does have a lab component with it. That once again, its lab is open two days a week. But just like EMT, a lot of the lab is mostly doing clinical time. So with the, the medic clinical time, you're going to be doing 500 hours of the ambulance time. You're going to do 144 hours at the hospital, and you're also going to be allowed to go into the OR and actually perform um, innovations on the patients that are getting uh, surgeries done once, once you get cleared to do those. So you're going to have a lot of exposure to patients. You're going to be out running calls with the ambulances, with the fire trucks again. When you're, when you're at Lakeland Regional, you're going to do rotations and labor and delivery, so you're going to help deliver babies. You're going to, uh, be work, you're going to do rotation in the ICU. Uh, you're going to be exposed in the, the, the uh, pediatric ER. So you're going to have a lot of hands-on real-life uh, experience when you're coming through the program. It's not just in a classroom. You get to kind of go out in the field, run real calls with real, with real crews, and, and you get a lot of exposure to, the, uh, uh, to real, real patients that you'll have. And this is the, uh, for, the EM, for the AS degree. So then this is kind of like a, a suggestion on how to do it. So when we talked about taking EMR, it was one class that meets once a week. So that leaves you open for other classes. Now, this is based upon how, uh, you know, if you're able to take a full load of classes, or, or maybe you only want to take three classes instead of four, but you can kind of do the course that's set up like this. So you take EMR and you take your, your, your basic A&P course with EMR the first semester. Your basic AMP, even though it's, it's a requirement for paramedic, it's gonna help you in EMR and EMT because believe it or not, the body is the same way for no matter what level you're working at, it's the same. Uh, so if you can get that one done with EMR, it'll help you out for the rest of your courses. And then you can take your college comp and your general psychology your first semester. Second semester, because you're gonna be going into the EMT class, that's gonna take up a lot of your time. So you take that. Uh, so you start typically in August for the EMR and then in January in the fall, you take your EMT. And then in the summertime, you can take your topics in mathematics and humanities, and then you start in August with paramedic school. And when the time you're done with paramedic school, you then have your 73 hours for your AS degree. You're now state of Florida certified paramedic, and you have your AS degree in emergency medical services. If you have any uh, questions about the program, you can email uh, the program at ems at pulse.edu. That goes to uh, myself, two coordinators, and the administrative uh, uh, assistant, and we can answer whatever question you may need. We all see when it gets answered, so there's plenty of people that will um, look at it. We are uh, doing all face-to-face -face classes right now. We have been pretty much since April, I think. We got back pretty much quick right away uh, doing our face-to-face -face classes. We, we are here on campus. If you wanted to, to come by and see the campus, you'd have to set up an appointment 
uh, with me because we we can't have you know 500 people show up at one time. But if you wanted to come by and see it, and you wanted to come and meet and, and talk to me, you're more than welcome to. If you contact us, that's kind of all I have. Uh, thank you guys for giving me the time to uh, to talk with you. Hi everybody, I'm Susan Watley, and here with me today is Carrie Shapiro, and we're with the Medical Coding Program. Hi, it's nice to meet you all. Um, you've heard from some great programs today, and so finishing up today, we're going to tell you about our program, the Medical Coding Specialist. We are here at the Polk State Airside Center in Southwest Lakeland. Uh, this is one of Polk State's campuses. This is where um, uh, the medical coding program is located, and it's also where some of the other programs that you've heard from today are located, radiography, sonography, and the cardiovascular technology program. So let's head on inside. Well, the medical coding program is one of our health science programs here at Airside. But we, are, we have one key difference. We don't engage in direct patient care, meaning we don't interact with patients in person. We don't touch them. We don't engage in their care. We're actually behind the scenes. And we're many times referred to as the business side of healthcare. The reason is that any time a patient has a healthcare encounter that involves being paid by insurance, medical coding is involved. So medical coding is the way everybody gets paid. So we're really a key and important part of the healthcare team. So what do medical coders do? Well, when a patient seeks medical care, there is always a medical record that's created. The medical coder reviews the record, looks at the patient's story, all the details, determines what was wrong with the patient or the diagnosis, what did we do for the patient or the treatment, and then we assign an alpha numerical code to it so that when the insurance company receives that, that statement, they know exactly what was wrong and what was done for the patient. In order to be able to read that patient's medical record and understand the diagnosis and the treatment, medical coding in our program, we study a variety of courses similar to the other healthcare field. We study, study anatomy and medical terminology for coding. We study pharmacology, disease processes, and a variety of coding courses themselves. Our program takes about five semesters to complete. It's about 18 months. It's taught here on the Airside Center West Campus. Students are required to be in class one night per week, and the rest of the work is done online. And what that means is that if a student needs to work um, full-time or part-time, they're able to do that and still complete our program. When you finish the program, you will have earned a college credit certificate, the medical coding, coding specialist. You are actually work ready, ready to go to uh, work as an entry level coder. But if you chose to continue on with, with further education, you could earn an AS degree in business with a focus or emphasis in healthcare administration, or you could continue on for an AS degree in health information management. But whether you choose to go on or whether you want to start working, you'll be prepared once you finish our program. So what does this really look like? Well, I have someone here with me to help me today. Um, his name is Cal. That's a really bad bone joke, right? Because calcium is one of the minerals in bones. Um, but anyway, Cal, as you can see, he was a, a former Polk State student. He's, he's pretty old, um, but he had a mishap. Um, he actually broke his little finger. Now, if you studied anatomy, um, you know that these are called phalanges. And so one of the ways that we're detailed in coding is that the patient may say, oh, I broke my little finger. But in coding, we're going to be very specific. Which hand was it? Which digit was it? And which phalanx was it? So poor cow, he broke the middle phalanx of the left little finger, okay? Because we have, we have proximal, middle, and distal phalanx. All right, so let's see what this looks like. Once we've read the record and we find out what happened to poor Cal, we come to our ICD-10-CM book. This is our diagnostic book. And we're going to look in our index. And you can see that for our index, we're in fracture, okay? Pages and pages of fractures because any place in the body where a fracture can occur, it's listed here. You don't have to memorize it. No, you don't memorize, you don't memorize the book. That's one of the first things that students ask is, oh my goodness, do I have to memorize this book? No, you memorize how to use the book. 
All right, so we're going to come, we've got fracture, and we're actually going to find finger, except the thumb. If it was thumb, we'd look somewhere else. And we're going to find little finger. Now, we've already said it's our little finger, but which phalanx was it? Well, we said it was the middle. And lucky for Cal, this is non-displaced. And so non-displaced means the bones are still aligned. So this is going to give us a place to start, S62.65. This is called our index. And we don't ever code from the index. We always go to our chapter, what we call tabular. And so here what we find, remember our number was S62.65. So here we have S62.65, non-displaced fracture of the middle phalanx of the finger. All right, so we know that we're in the right category, but the question was, which finger was it? Well, we have index, middle, ring, and here's our little finger. So now we just have to make sure we choose the right one right little finger or left little finger. So we know that Cal broke his left little finger in the middle phalanx. But if you can see right here, this little icon, if you can read it, it's, it says seven. You may not be able to see it real clearly. What this means is this particular code needs a seventh digit. So when we, when we look at the code, it's got six. And the, le the last digit is going to be another letter. And it's going to tell us which encounter is this for Cal? Is he seeing the doctor for the first time or subsequent times? Or maybe he's got problems related to this prior fracture. So in this particular case, Cal's seeing the doctor for the first time. So it would be the letter A. So we've put the code up on our board here. The code is S62.657A. This tells the insurance company when they read this record that Cal has had a non-displaced fracture of the middle phalanx of the left little finger, and it was the initial encounter for treatment. So what we've done is we've taken Cal's story and we've turned it into a code. Now, in addition to this diagnostic code, which is an ICD-10 code, we would also code any treatment we did. Maybe we had to do an x-ray for Cal. Maybe we had to put a splint on it. Any treatment that we did would also need another code. There are also codes that tell how in the world did this happen? Well, Cal was actually out riding his mountain bike and got off the trail and fell. So there's a code about riding a mountain bike. Did you know that there's crazy codes like bitten by an orca, falling off a tractor, being run over by a wagon, bitten by a shark? If any injury has happened to a human, it is in the code book. And the reason we assign that is it tells the story in greater detail. That's what coders do. We change the patient's written story to a story with alphanumerical codes so that the insurance company can properly pay the providers and the facilities. So you may be wondering, since this is a day where we're learning about clinical programs, you may be wondering, well, how does this all fit in? Well, sometimes we find that when students start in clinical programs, they find that that direct patient care to where they're talking to patients, they're touching patients, maybe they're exposed to blood or other body fluids, um, you know, smells and sights and sounds, patients in pain, they're, that may not be the best fit. For me, it's not a good fit. I love healthcare, I love the medical field, but the best analogy I can make is that I want to read the book, meaning I wanna read the patient's record, and I don't wanna see the movie. I don't wanna be in the room taking care of patients. So for me, the business side, the back side of it, still allows me to be involved with healthcare, but I don't have to be involved with direct patient care. So if you find yourself that perhaps the business side is more appealing to you and you think that would be a better fit, medical coding can be something that you consider as your career in the healthcare field. So if you're interested in healthcare and you're interested in coding, you can reach out to us. Our email is very simple, medicalcoding at polk.edu, and we are happy to send you additional information and answer any questions that you may have. And it sure was a pleasure speaking with you today. We look forward to talking with you soon. Have a wonderful day.